as uh, as as Doug said, I uh, I'm at the Humphrey School, um, just uh, down over here, and um, I've been leading a research group uh, here at the U for the last six years uh, on many different topics uh, in the energy sector. A lot of work has been focused on what I'll be talking about today on community solar. Um, this was not something I had studied prior to six years ago. It barely existed six years ago, and it's now a, a huge part of the solar market nationally and is really poised to play, I think, a really key role in how we think about decarbonization moving forward in the Biden administration's plan. He's brought on a lot of folks who want to know a lot about community solar as a real way to marry, as I'll talk about today, equity with energy transition and clean energy. Uh, some of the other work that, I, that we're doing uh, that Eric's been involved in um, and many of the folks on my team is related to rural energy issues. We're doing a project with a number of electric cooperatives uh, in the Midwest, but also nationally uh, related to how the specific co-op business model can be aligned with clean energy and energy transition. Um, in particular, one of the big questions that we're encountering is how do you grapple with some of the specific challenges of what we call the multi-level structure of electric cooperatives? Electric cooperatives are really different than other utilities. They're not for profit utilities. They're owned by their, the people who consume energy. So if you live in a rural area served by a co-op, not only are you getting your electricity from that co-op, but you also own your own utility. But um, one of the things that we've really focused on is how the G&T model, the generation and transmission model that co-ops formed way back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, how that model um, both provides opportunities and barriers to clean energy transition. So all the work with co-ops we're doing is about how the distribution members, utilities like Dakota or Conexus or Minnesota Valley, how they can work better with their GNT and think about how distributed energy resources fit into that picture. But really happy to go into those issues of uh, rural electric cooperatives if that's of interest uh, to the group. But I did prepare a full uh, presentation today on community solar and the work that we've been doing uh, on that. And so I will, um, I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully that's coming across okay. Does it look good? Yep, great. Um, as we go, I have a lot of slides, but really happy to take questions as we go. You know, I'm kind of condensing down about five years of work um, into this presentation. So basically everything you see is the tip of a different iceberg. So feel free to uh, ask questions and and we can go deeper wherever uh, there's particular interest. Yeah, great. All right, so just to start off to say that this is a very collaborative work. Um, I have a lot of folks on my research team. I've listed out many of the research assistants and staff researchers that have worked on uh, projects related to community solar over the last few years. We're also working with a lot of folks outside of the U. Um, we have a big project we've been doing with the University of Texas at Austin on community solar but also folks um, at Ohio University, Boise State, Dartmouth, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab. And then we've been really fortunate to have a great advisory board of folks from uh, many different sectors, uh, parts of the country who are working on advancing community solar. Great, so before getting into community solar, I wanna start with just a bit of framing around uh, this concept of energy justice, which has really, I think, come to prominence um, in just the last few years in both academic circles but also policy circles. The Biden administration has put, um, has created a new office for energy justice within the Department of Energy um, uh, and brought on a, a professor named Shalanda Baker to lead uh, that, that part of the work of the Department of Energy. So what is energy justice? Energy justice, I think, is best framed by the activists who advance this framework. This is a uh, definition of a just transition put forward by the Climate Justice Alliance. A just transition highlights moving us towards buen vivir, living well without living better at the expense of others, creating meaningful work, upholding self-determination, equitably redistributing resources and power, requiring regenerative ecological economics, retaining culture and tradition, embodying local, regional, national, international solidarity, and then also building the knowledge for what we need to know. I think this framework is helpful because it really highlights a lot of intersections. You know, you don't see on here um, balancing supply with demand or um, decarbonizing per se. Instead, it really focuses on the end goals. What are we doing this for? And what does it look like to do this in a just way transition? 
So with this framework, there's a lot of elaboration. Um, academic researchers have gone deeper to define energy justice as a framework for understanding. Uh, Kristen Jenkins out of the UK defines energy justice as a cross-cutting social science research agenda, which seeks to apply justice principles to energy policy, energy production and systems, energy consumption, energy activism, energy security, and climate change. And her framework and her colleagues' framework they highlight three tenets of energy justice, distributional, recognitional, and procedural. Distributional asks the question of how are the costs and benefits of a new energy system or energy transition shared? Who pays the cost? Who gets the benefits? And then how do we go about setting up systems that redistribute those costs and benefits in a more equitable way? Recognitional justice asks the question, who's being ignored and who are we listening to? whose perspectives are informing decision-making and whose costs and benefits uh, and desires are reflected in the decisions that we make. And then finally, procedural justice asks the question of what processes uh, are, are formed to make our decisions? Who gets to decide? Who has a voice in the process? Are those processes democratic and inclusive? So these tenets can be broken out further in our work. We're breaking out this concept of distributional justice into much more specific kinds of questions. So when we say, how are the costs and benefits distributed? Well, many energy programs, particularly energy efficiency programs, create savings. So who gets access to the cost savings with efficiency or other technology? When we apply this to community solar, we'll see many community solar projects are actually savings products. I'm sure that for, for those of you who've worked at MRES's community solar program, you know that it's, it's, it's difficult to create savings under a highly structured community solar policy or program. And then how you think about sharing those savings between subscribers, how do you think about the non-participants, the people who aren't participating in these projects? How do you build participation processes and practices to direct those savings to those who could benefit the most from that? So all that falls under, under this first bucket of access to savings. But there's another piece to that too, which is about pricing. How do we actually establish rates for electricity? This is a very complicated topic. We've done a lot of work in my research group related to utility rate design. For, for those of you who've been engaged in solar policy in Minnesota and elsewhere, you know that these debates over net metering, uh, debates over the value of solar, debates over avoided cost formulas, all these kinds of debates, fixed fees, all revolve around who pays for the costs of the legacy system, and then who gets the benefit from a system that's transitioning and really fundamentally changing those rate bases that underlie rates. And so pricing becomes a really important part of distributional justice, particularly because in most cases, uh, the residential rate class in particular is not usually subdivided um, sort of uh, uh, by, by statute. Energy burden, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of energy burden, which is defined as the percent of income that a household spends on energy. Across the country, the average energy burden is about 2%, but for low-income households, the average energy burden is upwards of 9, 10, or 11%. That inequality in how much of a person's or a household income is directed towards energy really creates a cost burden um, that then shifts the ability to pay for changes to the energy system. And then finally, the last bucket of distributional justice revolves around incomes. Who gets to earn money in the energy system and the energy transition? As we are considering deploying trillions of dollars in capital investments, that's gonna involve a lot of new jobs, but who gets to have those jobs? And how, how does the potential for income uh, derivation from the energy system shared? How is that shared? So that all falls under distributional justice. As we've already talked about, recognitional justice asks who's ignored and whose voice actually figures into the calculus. Procedural justice revolves around who participates in decision-making processes, and particularly what kind of compensation or resources are there for being able to participate in these processes. It also probably comes as no surprise to anyone uh, in this meeting that participating in energy decision-making, energy governance at the Public Utility Commission or at the legislature is really technically complicated. If you can't tell your kilowatts apart from your kilowatt hours, there's no way anyone's gonna listen to you when reliability is at stake. But yet many people who don't know the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour have important perspectives. 
And particularly as we ask the question of how do we create more accountability in our energy governance to the people whose lives are on the line, it really becomes a question of, well, how do we have voice in this process given that it's technical? How do we empower the right kinds of what we call intermediaries, people who are responsible to and accountable to those frontline communities, but that do understand those technical ins and outs? How do we empower them to be more powerful in the process? I think restorative justice, this concept has come up more recently in the work of energy justice, which asks how change, how energy transition actually can be directed in proportion to or in response to historic harms and trauma. And particularly in the energy system, parts that are extractive, parts where there's high pollution burdens, this notion of restoring what has been damaged in the energy system has become a really important framing concept as well in the domain of energy justice. Great, I see one comment in the chat here from Pete who says 2% of income going to pay for energy seems really light. Electricity, heating, motor fuel, unless giving 2% of income to pay for electricity. I mean, 2% uh, for non-transportation energy use. That's the national average. Um, but of course, the average is not a really good way to think about this. In just, a, in just a, um, I think, two slides, I'll show uh, more data on this uh, precisely. So hold on to that question. Um, this, this first is um, survey data. This was data collected in 2015 from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the EIA. And uh, this is from the REC survey, which is a great data source to understand the actual lived experience of energy. The survey includes things like, do you have a dishwasher? Do you have an air conditioner? How many light bulbs do you have? What's the square footage of your home, et cetera, et cetera. But in the 2015 version of this survey, they also asked households, have you experienced um, energy insecurity? And more specifically, they asked, have you received a notice from your utility in the last month of a, a disconnection notice, meaning that you're, you're behind payments and you're gonna be disconnected. Have you had to make a decision that made you make a trade-off between paying your energy bill and paying for food or medicine? And have you had to adjust your uh, indoor temperature or other energy uses in such a way that you uh, may have risked your health? For example, keeping your house too cool in the winter or too hot and in the summer. What they found was that across the country, 31% of households answered yes to one of those questions and reported some form of energy insecurity. That's an astounding number. Nearly one in three households are facing some form of dire energy insecurity. But that top line number, 31%, I think belies a lot of differences within that. That number is slightly lower for white households. It's much higher for Black, African-American, American Indian, Alaska Native households and Hispanic households. That uh, the number of households experiencing energy insecurity goes way up once you go below the federal poverty line, below $20,000 a year of income, half of households report energy insecurity. But even once you get up into the median range, $60,000 of income, still over three quarters of households are experiencing energy insecurity. There's a bit of a correlation between household, uh, the home age, where older households tend to have higher energy insecurity. Um, and housing type, mobile homes have the highest, apartment dwellers uh, next after that, single family homes are below average in terms of energy insecurity. So energy insecurity is quite pervasive and it's, it's quite a hidden problem. Um, I'll, let me skip to this slide first because I promised this one and I'll come back to the one before. This shows that energy burden data I mentioned before. This is just for Minnesota. What this data shows is the percent of income spent on non-transportation energy. So that's electricity, natural gas, and any delivered fuels. And what this shows is um, the energy burden by household by income. So what this shows is percent of federal poverty level. So let's focus first on the first five bars. I'll direct your attention here. What this shows is this first bar is households that are between zero income and the federal poverty line, 100% of the federal poverty line. And the average energy burden for households in Minnesota that have a natural gas hookup from a utility is about 14%, meaning that if you are at or below the federal poverty line and you have natural gas service to your household, you spend 14% of your income on energy. And that's broken out roughly, it's a little bit more electricity than gas, uh, but it's almost half half. 
Uh, as you move up the income ladder, this is again, percent of the federal poverty line, about $26,000 for a household of four. As you move up the poverty line, that energy burden goes way down. Um, if, if a household has uh, electrically heated, obviously there's much less of a natural gas burden and the overall energy burden is lower still. Delivered fuel households, meaning households that do not have uh, that heat with a delivered fuel like propane, have a much higher energy burden. Almost one third of income, almost, is spent on energy for households um, with delivered fuel. So energy burden is pervasive, and it's much. Uh, there's a very, very steep relationship with income. Say the State Department of Commerce in Minnesota has set a goal for every household in the state to have an energy burden below six percent. That's the state's stated goal for energy burden. Okay, so with all, of, oh, let me skip back. I skipped this slide. Um, this slide comes from some analysis that we've done uh, using the American Community Survey, which is a survey conducted by the US Census. And what this survey does is it, it's a very comprehensive survey across the entire country that asks many, many different questions about demographics, um, also includes uh, a few questions about energy, but you know, it's focused on a wide battery of types of questions. The couple of energy questions they ask are one, how do you heat your home? And two, how much money do you spend per year on energy? And they actually ask people to go and calculate this. What we did was we looked at this data from the 2019 survey and in particular we focused just in on Minnesota. And we built up a regression model that allowed us to estimate the, uh, the income Oh, sorry, excuse me, the amount of money, just dollars, spent on energy by different household types. And what we're doing here is we're controlling for a wide variety of factors. We're controlling for the uh, neighborhood that someone lives in. We're controlling for the age of the person's house. We're controlling for single family versus multifamily and apartment home. We're controlling for the heating fuel. With all those control variables intact, what we find is that black households in Minnesota that are below the federal poverty line spend 15% more than white households if they're homeowners and 6% more if they're renters. As you move up the income ladder, this racial gap in energy expenditures starts to go down. But even at $70,000 per year, the median income in Minnesota, black homeowners are spending 8% more on energy than white homeowners. And black renters are spending 5% more on energy than white renters. This racial gap is really, really hard to explain. It also is very consistent with national trends. It's a little bit larger in Minnesota than nationally, but it's the same ballpark range uh, for racial gap in energy expenditures. And uh, a study at UC Berkeley showed that, you know, the very, you know, almost the exact same model uh, found a, a black-white racial gap in energy expenditures. Really raising questions: Why? Why is this? And um, how can we better understand these drivers? Again, controlling for this wide variety of factors, um, this trend persists. Okay, so with all of this context now, I wanna to turn to community solar. As I mentioned at the top, community solar has been uh, really uh, put forward by uh, federal policymakers and state policymakers across the country as being a tool to address many of these uh, energy injustices that I've outlined before has the potential to reduce energy bills in a way that reduces energy burden. Uh, and ultimately the hope is that this would reduce energy insecurity as well. Let's get into community solar now. So why community solar? Um, well, first um, there's the physical dimension. So community solar allows households that do not have um, an appropriate rooftop for solar, don't own their house, don't own their roof, um, or don't have the financial uh, ability to install solar themselves. So about 75% of electricity customers around the country meet one of those conditions, don't own the roof, don't have a sufficient roof, uh, are a renter, or don't have the financial means to, in to install solar, to pay for solar. So uh, community solar opens up the solar market and allows the increasingly economic benefits of solar to be accessible to anyone. Community solar also creates jobs. In Minnesota, more than half of all solar installed in the state is through the community solar program for Excel Energy's customers. Estimate from Encia, I think from now about a year ago was that that program's created about 4,000 jobs. 
Um, there's uh, revenue in Minnesota estimate is that solar leases from landowners is about $1,000 per acre. That's revenue to rural landowners. I've seen other estimates more like $2,000 per acre. There's no universal data set on this, but it's significant revenue either way. There's tax revenue also associated with this. Community solar also provides for more local control, customer choice, and competition. Going to some of those questions I raised earlier about procedural justice, well, community solar really opens up who gets to make decisions about resources in the energy system. If you think about how resource decisions get made in Minnesota, if you are an Excel Energy customer, there's the integrated resource planning process. That's the big majority of resource decisions. But then outside of that, there's the community solar program, there's distributed generation below uh, the, the uh, net metering threshold. But those, you know, really community solar has widely opened the leverage that individuals have uh, and third parties have in making resource decisions. Again, going to that procedural justice piece. Community solar as a form of solar has environmental benefits and therefore contributes to climate change mitigation. And there's this increasing recognition that distributed generation might have technical benefits for the grid too. Avoiding distribution expenditure or transmission expenditure, uh, there's a potential here for technical benefits, particularly when you can reach economies of scale. This notion of using community solar as a kind of non-wires alternative, but uh, specifically if community solar can be paired with batteries, um, that can have significant technical benefits as well. Of course, there are technical costs as well, but usually those costs uh, can be uh, pretty fairly allocated to the developers. So what is community solar? Uh, this is a, a, a nice schematic developed by the National, Renewal, New, National Renewable Energy Lab or NREL um, that shows the general way in which community solar works. So in a community solar project, there's the customer and the solar project is not located um, on site of the customer. It's located somewhere else. It can sometimes be in the same county. It can be in the adjacent county. In some models, uh, we've even seen community solar that crosses state lines. But there's a solar project off-site of the customer. That solar project is metered. All the electricity from that project is sold to the utility. The utility has to buy that electricity at a rate and then credits the customer that's subscribing with a bill credit. The customer then pays the project some revenue or a subscription contract amount. And in some cases, the customer may retain the renewable energy credit or the utility might retain the renewable energy credit. Sometimes community solar is referred to as virtual net metering or more generally it's virtually metered. So it's, uh, it, I'll talk a lot about how these contracts are set up, uh, but essentially the way it would work is there's a uh, essentially a virtual metering meaning that that meter around the project is counted towards the customer's bill as if that meter was on site with that customer. So it's an interesting setup because what it does is it, it separates out the necessity for solar projects to be located on site of the customer. Thereby many customers together or a community of customers can work together to collectively finance that project. And oftentimes what we'll see is that a community solar project will be subscribed to by a mix of customers, some commercial customers with large, uh, with large accounts and some uh, small customers, residential customers. And that mix turns out to be a really great mix to go after financing. It really gives a good assurance that this project will be able to secure offtake. So this is the general setup of community solar in concept. Um, in practice, though, there's a lot of variety in the way in which community solar projects can be set up. We identify here six what we call archetypes of community solar projects. The most common one that we see in, uh, for example, uh, the community solar program for Excel Energy customers, there's a third party involved. And that third party builds the project, delivers the energy to the utility, and the subscriber pays the third party. But that's not the only way that this can be done. There are cases in which the utility actually gets involved in development. Uh, in the second row here, we show a muni, a municipal utility or a cooperative utility that actually can be the project uh, developer or equity owner in the project. And rather than the subscriber paying uh, a developer, they're actually gonna pay their utility and you can get consolidated billing in this way. A vertically integrated utility can also play this function. 
We see in markets that have deregulated that retail electricity provider can do this and then interface that solar project with the wholesale market, actually registering that project for competitive uh, sales into the wholesale market. That's very common in Texas. We see this happening on the distribution side with local utilities that are mostly distribution utilities also getting involved in some project development. And I find the last example here is actually customer led where subscribers themselves may develop the project and manage those subscriptions internally. So these different archetypes are all, are all kind of riffs on the same theme of separating out the utility functions such that you have a separate, usually bilateral contract between a solar project developer, either a third party or a utility um, and that customer. Um, and so ultimately at the end of the day, that customer is likely going to be buying electricity from a utility and also subscribing to energy from a solar project Thereby, it's like they have a power purchase agreement with that solar project. But typically, instead of a power purchase agreement um, that's formally you know, uh, sort of uh, registered, uh, this will be uh, formulated as a subscription contract. Okay, so where is community solar taking off? This is from our project that we're doing with the National Renewable Energy Lab. That shows the full history of community solar development um, over the last 14 years. What we show is that um, community solar is heavily concentrated in just a few states. There are now 3.3 gigawatts of community solar AC uh, across the country. Of that 3.3 gigawatts, um, almost 800 megawatts are in Minnesota, almost 600 megawatts are in Florida, and then you have about 500 or so megawatts in Massachusetts and New York. But this growth has been very um, unstable over time. While the, over top, the, the top line figure here shows a significant growth in the overall market, you can actually see that's been led by different waves of development in different states with Minnesota coming on and growing uh, very heavily in 2017, 2018. Massachusetts in the dark gray here coming in significantly in 2017 um, and then slowing down. New York coming a bit later in 2019 and 2020. This one in Florida is one really, really big project by Florida Power and Light. That's um, majority commercial subscribers, but still very, very large community solar project. Then you have the, the uh, rest of the states, the balance of the states filling out um, the rest here. But significantly, there's been a lot of growth um, in community solar, but it's been happening in different states. And a lot of this reflects, I think, policy design that has led to a lot of fits and starts in how community solar uh, is building out across the country. There's a lot of excitement and attention now to the new states that are developing community solar policies now. Maryland, which you see just at the very top here, has a very um, exciting new community solar program. Uh, new Jersey, which you don't see on this graph at all, has a very exciting community solar program. New Mexico, in their last legislative session, just passed a new community solar bill. Oregon has a very exciting community solar bill. All of these um, states are developing policies, but it takes about two years to develop a project, so you don't see any of that reflected here. So that's a bit of an overview of the uh, market. Um, here's this data represented graphically. The left a map of the states show um, where we see community solar activity and the policies that have supported that. So the dark blue are states that have community solar policies. The hatching is where utilities have themselves designed uh, community solar programs. In Minnesota, we have both. We have the Excel Energy Mandated Program. Um, and then we have uh, a number of community solar programs in munis, co-ops, and another investor in utility, Minnesota Power. But we also see that, uh, you know, if you think back to the previous slide, most of the growth, which has been driven, dominated by Minnesota, New York, Massachusetts, those are all states with policies. Florida's program is a bit of an exception to the rule there with that big Florida Power and Light project. Uh, the bottom right figure shows the individual projects and where they lie uh, across the country. You see that heavy concentration uh, in Excel territory in Minnesota, and then uh, the New York and Massachusetts stands out there too. So is this cumulative? Uh, the previous slide, no, this is, an uh, sorry, the big figure is annual additions. And then the right figure is cumulative capacity for um, just uh, at the end of 2020. So 3.3 gigawatts cumulative uh, of that uh, almost one third was added just in 2020. 
Um, we have done a big data collection effort as well to collect um, all of the subscription contracts from community solar projects. I mentioned this at the top, um, that community solar projects vary in the amount of value they pass through to customers. If you subscribe to community solar, in many places, you actually um, pay a premium. So think back to some of the green pricing programs you may remember from uh, the early 2000s and late 90s, things like WindSource. Um, these were projects that all asked you to pay an extra one or two cents on your energy bill, maybe even more, um, to you know, get the benefits of clean energy, which really meant a renewable energy credit. Many community solar projects look like that from a financial perspective. When we look at the net present value of community solar projects, we see about one, one quarter, about 25% about of community solar projects are premium products, meaning they ask subscribers to actually pay something to participate. But about three quarters of community solar projects are now savings projects, meaning that if you subscribe, on average, you're gonna save money. Oftentimes the savings is pegged to whatever your share of that garden uh, produced in the last month. Um, but we see that based on our modeling, about uh, three quarters of projects uh, do provide savings uh, to customers. They're not always a lot of savings, um, but some of them, some of them are. We show here the net present value in terms of dollar per watt. Um, as a uh, very rough translation, uh, you can think of um, $1 a watt as uh, roughly, uh, I, I think about $150 per year of benefits. So. Um, that would be like up here. So that'd be a significant contract. Okay, so why community solar? Energy transition, as I think we all know, is going to require a lot of capital deployment. As I mentioned, you know, on the order of trillions of dollars to reach net zero by 2030 um, or any of these other such targets. But how we deploy that capital efficiently and equitably is ultimately going to involve thinking about market power, rules, aka policy, and how to deploy this capital to achieve the multiple objectives of everyone involved in this decision. So that includes the policymakers, it includes the voters who are gonna put those policymakers into power, it includes financial markets, it includes landowners, it includes em employee, employers and employees. All of these different kinds of actors will need to be satisfied in order to, to bring about trillions of dollars of investment. And that's going to vary by local context. So as we think about this big capital deployment, you know, I think that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of attention to how do we do this? What are the low hanging fruits? How do we do this quickly? What's the most cost effective way to get the biggest bang for your buck? But I think the challenges or the problems with that framing is that the most the most efficient depends on from what perspective. The most efficient from a capital markets perspective, meaning to the financial sector. Well, how do we think about land use? I think a lot uh, in energy transition about the challenges of transmission siting. You know, if you look at some of the integrated assessment modeling or some of the complex economic modeling going out there that look at what does it take to get to zero carbon by 2030, 2035, et cetera, these models show we need a lot of transmission build out. We're going to spend billions of dollars on building out transmission. Well, how you build transmission is really complicated. Again, you need to satisfy the financiers, you need to build the labor force, you need to think about the land rights, you need to think about the market rules, and ultimately you need to think about the people in power and who's voting them in. And I think once you expand your analysis to include all of that, it really makes it much more complicated to say, well, how, how much, where, and how do we build out something like transmission? This is gonna be true for every part of our energy transition. But with transmission, I think it just makes it really clear that there are a lot of stakeholders who are going to make various transmission projects easier or harder than others. So community solar comes in as I think a real potential intersectional approach to energy transition. Community solar comes in as a way to think about deploying clean energy in a way that actually leans into this idea of redistributing cost and benefits and power. And if we think about trying to engage across finance, impacted communities, policy, as we think about all of these pieces together, community solar is probably not perfect on any of those dimensions. If it's just about build as much solar as you can, 
you know, you would save some money not having to find off takers and just put it onto the grid. Uh, if we're talking about what's the most equitable way to build jobs, well, it's probably not in, in solar at all. It's probably in doing a lot more energy efficiency in distributed solar. Distributed solar is more jobs than uh, community scale solar per kilowatt. Um, it, and, uh, you know, as a way to reduce energy burden, probably community solar is not the most effective way to reduce energy burden. It's probably energy efficiency and weatherization. But if we think about trying to hit all of these things at the same time and to, and to build a political coalition, you know, I think we need to look for those win-win-wins um, rather than policies that are just optimal in one dimension. That's a bit of a political theory, and that's just my own subjective opinion. But certainly we're seeing that there's a lot of momentum to try to find these intersectional solutions that bring about um, mutual benefit for those many different perspectives. I see Catherine here asked about microgrids. Yeah, I was on, uh, I actually gave a seminar this morning uh, with a utility out in Southern California, Anza Electric Co-op. Uh, they're a small co-op um, out by Palm Springs, California. And they've been devastated by wildfires. They're really relying on the grid for power. And um, they they were disconnected for two weeks from the grid uh, last year, I think last year uh, during the wildfire season. So they got a big loan to do a microgrid. And it makes a ton of sense in their context because already they are seeing huge costs from not having a reliable power supply. So I think microgrids make a lot of sense today in those contexts. Moving forward though, what's the role for microgrids? Well, I, I think it's a bit more complicated. You know, I think there's you know two big schools of thought. Um, there is not enough affordable renewable energy in Massachusetts. So how are they going to meet their clean energy goals? Well, they're looking to build a transmission line to Quebec, but landowners in Vermont, New Hampshire have blocked that project. So now they're looking to go offshore. Well, they have a long history of challenges trying to build offshore Massachusetts and wealthy landowners uh, with coastal properties blocking those projects. They'll still pursue that, that's great. Now they're looking, well, okay, they're kind of boxed in. So where else can you go? Well, you can go uh, for them westward, looking to the Midwest for cheap wind. That involves a lot of transmission. How do you build out that transmission? Um, that's a big now challenge for Midwest landowners with uh, competing land uses there and, and um, you know, a lot of value there. So how do distributed resources fit in? You know, certainly Massachusetts is going all in building out solar. Uh, I think that's an important approach. Microgrids can come in to support that potentially, but I think there's a lot of interest in how you think about more interconnection, not less interconnection at this point. So that's an interesting question. Uh, I think a lot of the modeling that you see out there points to transmission as being the most cost-effective way for the whole country to decarbonize. But certainly, as I mentioned already today, there are areas where microgrids make a ton of sense. Um, yeah, I see another question here from Chris about, does community solar include hybrid wind solar projects? There are not a lot of those examples. There are some examples of hybrid solar storage, community solar, hybrid wind solar. I know we have some of those products. I haven't seen them set up as a community solar project. Um, you know, there's the, the Lake Region project. I think that's a good example um, of hybrid wind solar. That, that project I think works because wind and solar are um, decorrelated or anti-correlated when it comes to their time profile. So you can get a lot of uh, good demand charge reduction benefits out of hybridizing wind and solar co-located. I haven't seen that play out in community solar because those are mostly utility benefits that end customers don't see, you know, unless you're a CNI customer with a demand charge, it doesn't really matter. You're going to be virtually net metered in most cases anyway. So hybridizing is mostly a grid or utility benefit, not an individual residential um, benefit, unless you're a big CNI customer. So I have not seen that example play out, um, but those projects do exist, just not as a community solar project. Yeah, how can communities gain the awareness needed to further grow community solar in more places? That's a great question. That's something that I actually have quite a few slides on this? coming up. Okay. Uh, small scale wind energy equipment per watt is so much more expensive than utility scale wind. Yeah, that's certainly what it looks like. You know, I would say, you know, just like solar with wind, um, there are scale economics. Understanding those scale economics is important and it's changing. It's a bit of a moving target. Certainly with wind, you want to go, um, you know, as I understand it, you want to go bigger and bigger and bigger on the blades. The bigger you can make the blades, the more effectively you'll capture uh, wind energy. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that's, that's a unique thing to win that has to do with just wind physics. Um, with solar, those scale economics are, are difficult to understand and say, you know, I'll refer you to the ILSR blog on, on uh, that estimation it really comes down to uh, how you think about um, fixed cost reduction. Okay, let me press ahead. I think I just have 15 more minutes here. So let me jump to some good parts here. So um, I introduced community solar. Not all community solar is equitable. As I mentioned, a quarter of community solar projects cost money to participate in. Those are not going to reduce energy burden. They're going to increase energy burden. So we've taken a lot of time in our group to try to understand, well, what is equitable community solar? We define equitable community solar as community programs or policies that intentionally distribute both the benefits and burdens of the energy system more equitably in recognition of current and historic marginalization, create inside and outside the energy system, while adopting practices and procedures that engage and empower all impacted stakeholders in a non-discriminatory, empowering and accessible fashion, including consideration of capital ownership, energy sector employment, among other factors. So we end up with a long definition. It takes a long time to get there. I think the reason why is because, as I said, I think that equitable community solar is really trying to do more than one thing at the same time. If we were defining efficient community solar, it would be solar at least cost. Uh, equitable community solar is more complicated. And, and why focus on equitable community solar? Just to reiterate a point, you know, I think it's that um, you know, ultimately energy transition is going to be expensive, even though we're going to benefit as society from addressing climate change. And in total, over many generations, it will be worth it to spend a lot of money to address climate change and decarbonize our energy system. But it's not gonna feel that way for a really long time. And we won't actually ever know it because if we avoid climate change, we won't know all the disasters that didn't happen. And we won't know how much money we saved by addressing climate change now. So from, it fundamentally becomes a political problem. How do we build up the political will to address climate change now without ever seeing the other side of the balance sheet? And so ultimately I think it becomes a political problem where it, it requires engaging a lot of people to raise the capital and the will to raise that capital um, to make these investments. And I think that's where equitable policy comes in. There are, you know, as I showed, there are a lot of people in dire energy situations. They're in dire economic situations because of the energy system. O almost one third of Americans have faced energy insecurity in the last year. And so these people can become activated if the energy transition benefits them and does something about energy insecurity. And many households spend less than 2% of their income on energy and can afford higher energy costs. And so if we think about leaning into this notion of equity in our energy transition policies and think about doing two things at once, I think we really then can uh, start to build the political will needed for that long term that we need to fully decarbonize our energy system uh, right now. Okay, so um, a lot of states are starting to build these connections. 10 states have explicitly developed policies that link together low income or low moderate income participation with community solar. Uh, for example, Massachusetts requires that 50% of, of uh, if a project has 50% of its output directed towards low income customers, that project gets a six cent per kilowatt hour benefit, a significant benefit uh, from that program. Uh, New Jersey also has uh, these kinds of benefits uh, for projects that direct the output of those projects to low income households. So in effect, this sets up a, an incentive for developers to build community solar projects and then subscribe the benefits to low-income households, reduce their energy burden, and then pays for it through rate programs, rate riders that all other electricity customers pay for. So um, what we've been doing, we did a project with UT Austin where we tried to really understand exactly how you can do this. One of the things that we've learned from some of our interviews is that having an incentive or even a mandate in place to have low-income customers participate in community solar, one of the barriers remains is actually communicating and engaging households in that work. In other words, you can create a financial incentive, but it sounds too good to be true. It sounds too good to be true to say to a low-income household, sign this 20-year contract and you're going to get six cents 
a benefit per kilowatt hour. That doesn't mean anything to most households. So what we found is that it's become really important to the success of these low income focus programs to engage community organizations. This can look like churches, it can look like community centers, it can look like state government, it can look like community action partnerships or community action agencies, uh, it can look like schools. All of these trusted community-based organizations can play a really uh, important role in both designing projects and then subscribing community solar projects uh, to those who would benefit the most. So what we did was we spent a lot of time talking to community-based organizations. Community-based organizations uh, like the ones I mentioned, both the ones who are doing community solar and the ones who are not doing community solar. In fact, some of the most interesting conversations that we had were with organizations that started off not a solar organization, not even an energy organization, but a community organization, then building trust with a solar developer or a third party or utility to understand how community solar could benefit, really looking into the numbers and understanding this, and then the community-based organizations activating their organizations to bring about that high participation and benefit and trust needed to make these projects work. So it's a bit of a theory on this slide showing how we're thinking about this. Um, I'll go into some of those results in just a minute here. Um, Donald has a question, how do you define distributed solar? <laughs> um, well, uh, solar connected to the distribution grid. How about that for a definition? Um, there are a lot of other definitions. We could look, you know, there's, step, there's mandatory definitions about, um, you know, small scale generation or what distributed generation legal definitions. Um, I think for uh, the purposes here, solar connected to the distribution grid. So uh, community-based organizations can do a lot of things. Um, they can act um, as uh, intermediaries between households and developers who are building projects. They can act as aggregators who bring together many projects and then subscribe out to individuals from that bank of projects. Uh, or they themselves can organize communities and then bring those full communities together to a project. So all of these roles are really important. Um, CBOs, as we call them, community-based organizations, can play a role uh, recruiting individual subscribers. So this would be like, for example, in North Minneapolis, the Shiloh Temple project. Uh, Cooperative Energy Futures built a community solar garden on Shiloh Temple's roof. And then Shiloh Temple as a religious organization, never before having been involved in energy, activated their congregation to subscribe to that project. Um, in aggregated projects, community-based organizations can create platforms or markets uh, for community solar projects. There are a lot of organizations um, that act nationally like Arcadia Power, um, uh, Power Market IO. Uh, there was an attempt to build one here called um, A Sharp Energy. Um, all these trying to aggregate projects and make it easier for subscribers to find those projects. And then I think where the most exciting role for community-based organizations is themselves organizing members um, and potentially passing through the benefits in a monetary fashion to those uh, members. So we see multifamily housing, St. Paul Housing Authority, subscribes to Community Solar and uses that subscription to lower their costs and passes that through to the residents in St. Paul Public Housing uh, through lower energy bills. Uh, we also see, for example, uh, MnDOT subscribes to Community Solar. Uh, that's very indirect, but what MnDOT does is they lower their operating costs by subscribing all the street lights um, in certain areas to Community Solar and actually then lowering their cost of doing um, business in the state. And that benefits everyone you know, indirectly through I suppose, a lower tax uh, bill. Um, yeah, we've done, uh, let's see, uh, Rich asks, uh, how much potential impact do you think community-based organizations can have on the overall market? Right, it really depends what the goals are. What does impact mean in that question? If the impact is, um, you know, reducing a household's energy bill, well, a community-based organization can play a key role in connecting the most vulnerable populations to this opportunity of community solar. You know, another kind of community-based organization we're doing work with is Community Action. Um, so Community Action of Hennepin, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey, Washington, these are organizations that are directly connecting households to energy assistance. If you throw away a sustainable resource center, also uh, weatherization services. Could these organizations also provide direct impact to households through community solar? We're exploring that with the Department of Commerce right now. So I think if impact is measured by energy burden on most vulnerable households, huge. If it's about impact in terms of megawatts in the ground, maybe not. You know, those big, sophisticated commercial customers, you know, the Ecolabs, the Targets, 
University of Minnesota's. Those are all organizations that had community solar subscriptions that didn't rely on a community-based organization to get those subscriptions. They're sophisticated enough with a big enough energy staff that they could see the benefit and just chase after it. We had done a lot of theorizing on the roles of community-based organizations. We created this kind of function map, as we're calling it, of the different roles that CBOs can play from market researching to policy making to providing legitimacy for this model, to citing, to regulation, to scoping out projects, financing, legal services, subscribing members, developing the projects themselves, doing the EPC, managing operations, managing subscribers. A lot of different roles for a community-based organization. I think MRES has played several of these roles uh, in your project. We have some case studies that show the different kinds of CBOs that do this work. Um, this is that, taking that function map and now mapping out in the case of the Oatana solar projects, you may have heard about this project that uh, Simpa and Compass invested in down in Oatana. Uh, I think it's a five megawatt project um, serving, I think 14 different municipal utilities in the central and Southern part of Minnesota. What was really interesting about this project is that they engaged a lot of folks, a lot of different organizations got involved to do this work. Um, you had the local public utilities, you had the uh, joint action agencies, you had a developer, um, all getting involved to help support the different functions in this project, all community-based organizations. Um, those are mostly energy organizations. Uh, when we go to some other examples, this is one example from Texas out of Houston, um, South Union. They developed a, a community solar project and they activated the South Union Community Development Corporation, a local, um, a local organization that helped build out this project. They also got the city involved. And so actually city government helped with the siting and legitimating this model. Uh, we have a lot more of these kind of case studies and mappings of the different kinds of CBOs that get involved in community solar. Um, let me skip here because I'm, I'm right at the end of time here. I wanna end, um, let me end with a few thoughts on Minnesota actually. So in Minnesota, as I mentioned earlier, we have one of the largest community solar programs in the country. Um, we have the largest by megawatts. Um, and Excel Energy's program is huge. Here's the uh, progress of Excel of the program in Excel's territory over time. 784 megawatts of operating community solar um, in Excel's territory. That's the majority of solar in Excel. Um, we see there's a pipeline of projects moving through design and construction, uh, interconnection study at the application stage. We can see the fits and starts in this program. When the community solar program was first introduced, there was a huge influx of community solar projects, uh, applications from a lot of outside developers. There's a lot of dispute over the rules of the program. And as those rules have been clarified over time, you've seen that the volume of applications has really declined. The tariff structure has also changed quite a bit. And at a certain point, there are no new applications in the mid part and late part of 2017. And only recently are they starting to pick back up mostly due to the continuing decline cost of solar and more clarity over the rules of the program. Um, are community solar products usually distributed solar? Uh, yes, they're all distribution connected. The vast majority of projects are one megawatt projects now. So almost all new applications are coming in at exactly the one megawatt size, uh, which happens to be the cap uh, uh, for capacity in statute. We've been doing a lot of work at the Minnesota Public Utility Commission to understand the tariff structure for the community solar program. Minnesota in 2013 passed a statute called value of solar or passed a, a, a rule called value of solar, which actually is designed as a net metering replacement. It requires, uh, sorry, it gives the option to utilities to not net meter solar, but instead purchase solar back at the value it contributes to society. It's a very innovative policy. Minnesota was the first state in the country to pass this policy. It really is, I think, a bellwether of what all 49 other states are going to have to figure out at some point. How do we move beyond net metering to a value-based compensation, especially as we move to put more and more solar on the grid? Net metering is gonna get a worse and worse way for utilities to recover their fixed costs. So how do we replace that with a fair and equitable tariff? Value of solar comes in as a way to actually say, let's add up in a very scientifically grounded way, those benefits that solar is bringing. And Value of Solar Minnesota includes all of the carbon benefits as estimated by the social cost of carbon. It includes pollution damages. It also includes avoided fuel, avoided generation capacity, avoided transmission capacity, avoided distribution capacity. 
we've been doing a lot of work in this docket to understand exactly how this is working and it's tough it's complicated it's technical and it really 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 matters since 2017 the value of solar has declined by about 20 percent and it's really perverse why that's happened it's perverse because natural gas costs have declined and the part of the value of solar is it allows the utility to avoid purchasing gas and the way the formula works is it's based on forecast of natural gas prices so as gas costs have declined, the value of solar declines because the utility is purchasing less gas. But that's exactly the opposite of what you would want, right? The, what you actually wanna do is peg the value of solar to the volatility in the price of gas because solar is providing a hedge value. And so as we saw over the President's Day weekend, the average Minnesota household is gonna spend between three and $500 more per year on gas from that one weekend. And so what do we do about that? If there was more solar on the grid, it wouldn't be three to $500, it would be less. But solar is not incentivized for that. In fact, it's the opposite. So we've been trying to make this argument uh, in front of the Public Utility Commission about how to update this formula to be more accurate in terms of what solar's real value is um, and, and how we should think about that. But I think the framework of value solar is really accurate. And right now, um, this applies to all new community solar projects. Uh, in Excel's territory. It's in fact the only place where value of solar applies. And it's a really important part of how we think about equity because if you get the value of solar right, there's no cross subsidy. And in fact, when value of solar is being developed, there was consensus between Excel Energy, uh, Mincia, uh, the Department of Commerce, that value of solar was the way to do solar right, to move beyond net metering. Um, and it's being tested out right now at large scale with community solar. And a lot of challenges still. Uh, the framework, I think, is right, but the implementation is difficult. Okay, so let me see. I think I'm just at time here. Let me just end um, with this picture here. Yeah. Uh, if if you if you've got some more stuff to share with us, we can go another uh, a little while, maybe ten minutes or so. Okay. Well, I have an endless amount of stuff. So let me show um, maybe this slide. Um, this is a bit of analysis that we've done on a couple of community solar projects in Minnesota. Right now, um, there's an open docket that we're participating in with a few other groups. Uh, we had a conversation with Cooperative Energy Futures and Community Power um, and, um, and ILSR um, about uh, what's called the residential adder. So in 20, um, 2017, 2018, the Minnesota Public Utility Commission actually um, added in an adder to the value of solar. The history of this actually goes back to the 2013 solar law that the, the legislature passed, which actually includes the phrase that community solar um, must be accessible. And in that, in that accessibility, there was never a definition of what accessibility meant. Um, the Public Utility Commission then decided that they had the authority to test out on a pilot basis, a financial incentive for community solar projects to be compensated an additional 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour for residential subscribers. That pilot has now run for two years um, and uh, is now under question for whether it should be extended or not. Uh, we are arguing that it should be extended um, uh, for several different reasons. One of those reasons being we don't have enough data yet to know um, how many uh, residential subscribers will be able to participate because of this incentive but also because it can play an important, although insufficient role in addressing energy burden. So here we're showing energy burden in Hennepin, Washington and Ramsey counties. Um, these are the three main counties that Excel Energy serves and where community solar subscriptions are happening. We're showing is energy burden now uh, in blue, currently business as usual, uh, again by income group here. So this is, you think of basically below the poverty line and then as you go up, um, it's percent of uh, area median income or state median income, about $70,000. So if you're uh, below um, the federal poverty line or sort of at or below, average energy burden in these three counties is 9.3%. If you have a community solar subscription, a typical community solar subscription, that 9.3% energy burden becomes 8.7%. And then when you go from uh, the community solar subscription to community solar with the one5 cent adder, that goes down to an 8% energy burden. So it reduces energy burden by, you know, a, about 10% or so, a little bit more than 10%. That's significant. It's not sufficient to get to that 6% goal, but it makes a lot of progress towards that. 
So the resonance structure adder becomes a really important tool to connect the dots between, I think, the, the intersectional potential of community solar um, and energy burden. I think it really brings this together. Um, and we're arguing that on that basis, the accessibility of community solar really hinges on having uh, this adder in place. So that, that docket is now open for one more month until June 20th, I believe. Um, and uh, if you're curious, it's docket 13-867 at the PUC, and you can read uh, all the great input there. Um, uh, yeah, so why don't I wrap up there, and I can take some more questions. Gabe, do you have, have a couple minutes to just uh, briefly go over some of the other things you're working on? Sure, yeah, happy to. Yeah, I think we talked about that. Um, I can talk about our project that we're doing with Great River Energy. So Eric uh, has been working on this project for the last year. We are working with GRE, which is a generation transmission co-op that serves uh, 28 distribution co-ops throughout Minnesota, covering a huge part of rural Minnesota. Um, GRE, um, headquartered out of uh, Maple Grove, I think, they, um, they have been engaged in demand-side management for decades now. Uh, demand-side management, if you're not familiar, is a way to control load in response to costs. So in other words, when energy costs are high, GRE can actually send out a radio signal um, that turns down people's water heaters. Um, so if you're an Excel customer, it's called Saver Switch. GRE runs a number of these programs um, with water heaters, with irrigators, with CNI, uh, commercial industrial um, diesel ge generation sets, um, uh, even with uh, heating and cooling. Wide variety of these programs. We're trying to understand exactly how these programs can operate as GRE moves to close their biggest coal plant, Coal Creek in North Dakota and moves to purchase more energy off of the MISO wholesale market. Wholesale markets work really differently than an internal generation transmission provider may think about their energy costs. So we're doing a lot of work to understand, particularly with um, the FERC order 2222, what this looks like. A lot of technical details and regulatory wonky things going on, but really what we're doing is trying to understand how can you communicate to the residential end user down at the end of the line why sometimes their utility needs to turn off their water heater in order to create benefits for everyone. Um, and why that's an important piece of the transition to clean energy, clean and affordable energy. Um, and why something like that is really important for thinking through um, the benefits of, of moving to the wholesale market and um, how it's okay to have variable generation and still have reliable service. Um, you're going to be testing that this weekend with 90 degrees and shutting off yeah. air conditioners. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If you're a GRE member, um, you may see, um, you know, some control uh, going on this weekend. Yeah. Um, and then we're doing another project with East River Electric Co-op. They're another GNT that serves uh, co-ops in South Dakota and parts of southwestern Minnesota. We've been doing a project with them with the Department of Energy um, and the National Renewable Energy Lab to look at um, how that GNT can deploy solar in a way that really benefits their members. Thinking really creatively about how solar deployment can uh, be paired with ethanol production. Um, that's a really interesting test case. Ethanol takes a lot of energy to produce. Um, and so there's a real good opportunity to co-locate solar energy um, at, at an ethanol production facility. You know, ethanol, a lot of challenges. Ethanol certainly has a lot of value right now, particularly if you can sell out to California. So a lot of, uh, a lot of folks um, in the Midwest who are growing corn for ethanol are looking for ways to lower their carbon footprint. Um, you know, it's not really um, our space to critique that part of it, but certainly we are trying to make the case for why big solar deployment can be a way to uh, really create a win-win between the utility and those big energy consumers that they're dealing with. Um, and then we are also looking at other models for community solar out in the cooperatives, um, which also uh, presents a lot of good opportunities. Gabe, are you are you doing any work with uh, like University of uh, Morris, where they're looking at using, um, uh, you know, the breakdown to hydrogen to anhydrous ammonia and then storing that for energy? Yeah. Solar? Yeah, we are. We put in a big grant proposal to the National Science Foundation uh, with, um, with Mike Reese and his team 
um, to look at exactly that, that ammonia production, how do you think through uh, these distributed energy hubs? Yeah, that, that sounded really exciting. Yeah. I have a question. Are, are you doing anything? Um, I'm just learning about the 5% uh, renewable energy that, that co-ops are allowed yeah. to produce um, for themselves um, under a GNT contract. And I'm wondering, it sounds like it's pretty hard for them to actually get that through. And I, why? I mean, can you do anything to help facilitate that kind of movement? What's the complexity there? Yeah, we're doing a lot of work related to that. I know a lot about this. That's a GRE rule. Not every co-op has that 5% rule. Um, every co-op's different. Uh, I think the important thing to keep in mind, I, I mean, a few things is that what's called that self-supply. Um, that's something that, you know, co-ops, distribution co-ops own the GNT. They are the owners of the GNT. And so actually when we talk about those carve out rules, that was actually an agreement that the co-ops set for themselves. The GNTs are of and by their members. Now things have changed. The main reason that those 5% requirements or caps were put in place was to provide the assurances that the big centralized generators could pay off their debt. And so when there were these agreements to set up big coal plants, essentially, um, it was necessary to make sure there would be sufficient revenue to pay back that debt that was, take, that was required to take out for those plants. So that's why those agreements were put in place. There are a lot of examples where this is being looked at again. Now, especially as these coal plants retire, the rationale for those carve-outs or the, that self-supply carve-out, those are changing. Are you um, saying self-applied? What's the, what are you the saying? Self-supply. Self-apply. Self-supply. Oh, self-supply. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in Georgia, for example, they solved this really creatively. They basically broke up their GNT into three different entities, um, into a transmission entity, a generation entity, and a clean energy entity. And those three different entities all work together now, but it's allowed those co-ops to get out of their self-supply requirements. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a challenge. There's a lot of history to grapple with in thinking about this. And I think going back to those fundamental reasons is really important to understand why those self-supply agreements are in place and where they came from, because ultimately it came from the members themselves. It didn't come from any outside regulator. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, the GNT's financial health is the distribution member's financial health. Yeah, and so, um, you know, I think those are, those are being looked at. I think as, as I said, as those fixed assets retire, I think that's the opportunity to say, okay, well, what does it look like to be in a GNT cooperative now moving forward? Gabe, do you think that uh, uh, the GRE pulling back from the coal plant in North Dakota is going to happen, or is that third party going to step in there and keep that plant going? Oh, I think GRE is out, no question. They said they'd be willing. They said publicly they're willing to sell it for a dollar, um, so they're walking away. Whether or not that coal plant continues to operate with another owner, that's a different question. And that's, you know, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hearing that, that that other organization, and I mean, then North Dakota is saying, okay, we'll open up our transmission lines to renewable energy in North Dakota, which, you know, up until now, they've really pushed back on. So it's, uh, I know there's some people uh, really concerned about the fact that that plant's not actually going to get shut down, you know, for environmental reasons, for sure. Yeah, and that, you know, that's a little bit out of GRE's control. You know, I think that's the challenge with all these coal plant co closures. You have people who see that it's not worth it to keep running them, even at marginal cost. Um, I mean, they pay down their debts and it's still not worth it. Um, whether or not that plant closes, that's a different question. You know, there's a lot of local value in that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Great presentation. Um, sure thing.